Let's do it. Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you in our worship service this morning. Let's all begin with a prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful spring morning. We thank you, Lord, for another day that you have given us life on this earth. We thank you, Heavenly Father, on this Sabbath that we can take time right now via the internet and we can give you glory. So we can seek your word, that our hearts can be moved by your Holy Spirit, that we can be available under the circumstances that we all face now. Lord, we pray for patience. We pray, O oh God, that your, your will will be done. We pray that hearts will be touched, that faith will be renewed. Be with us now as we worship a holy God. We humble ourselves before you, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're going to begin our service off with a special music by Mr. Boyd Hewlin. And he is going to sing probably my favorite of all hymns, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Boyd. Oh uh -huh. 
Thank you, Boyd. I know that if our congregation was here right now, there would be standing and clapping in this room. We would probably hear a hearty amen and praise Almighty God from uh, uh, Reba. So, uh, Reba, if you're listening, blessings to you this morning, to all of you. I miss all of you. I really look forward, I'm sure we all do, look forward to the day that we can assemble back here and, and worship as we have in the past. I think we're going to worship with a renewed excitement, actually, and I see God uh, working in the midst of the storm in mighty ways, and so I look forward to that day so very much. Our scripture lesson this morning, it comes out of John chapter 21, and we're going to read verses 9 through 19. That's John 21, 9 through 19, if you want to follow along in your Bibles. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went abroad, and he hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he had been raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt. Because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. Now he said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we search these words today, we pray, O oh God, they will speak directly to our hearts right in the circumstance that we are all facing. So many of us in our faith, we struggle in those times of tribulation and hardship. There are times we want to throw our hands up and just return to an old world, an old life that we used to live before we met you. Sometimes we want to run and hide. We feel disappointed. Or maybe our faith has been shaken. Gracious God, we can't see you in the darkness of the storm. So many times we can't hear you when you speak. And it is not because you left us, Lord, but it's because we have left you. We have gone in a direction that will not end well until we come back home. Lord, open our hearts to this great truth. Let us look at this story through the eyes of Simon Peter and of John. Let us hear you speak those words to us this morning. Let our spirits listen to your Holy Spirit. O oh, Holy Spirit, speak to us. We come before you, O oh Lord, and we are humbled. 
We are humbled in this day in which we live on this earth. Our life has changed. We need for all of us to be reminded that you are always there. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. This is an interesting story. I love this story, actually. Because this is it's a very human story. Here you have Simon Peter, and this is after the resurrection of Christ. And actually, this will be the third appearance of Jesus to several of his disciples that had gathered together. Simon probably just trying to find, where do I go from here? I had lost all hope. It did not turn out the way that I wished it would have. There was not a kingdom set up in Jerusalem. There was an execution of my Savior. And in his time of need, after I promised him that I would be there for him, fear overtook me. I just didn't see that coming. I thought I was more courageous than that. I thought I was bolder. What did the other disciples must think of me at this point? They sort of dubbed me as their leader, and yet here I am, hiding out. I didn't even believe at first that our Lord had risen from the dead. I needed hard proof like everyone else. I was hiding. When Mary came in and told me that the grave was empty, the first thing that came to my mind wasn't that he rose from the dead, it was that someone stole his body. I was just like her. I was frightened and hurt. I just did not know how much more to take. But yet he has proven himself faithful and now that I look in hindsight, I remember how he did tell us that he must die. I didn't want to hear it. None of us did actually. We were listening, not with our hearts, but with our own intentions, our own hopes and dreams. But here I am trying to find what to do now. When I see him, I'm in one moment I'm excited and the next moment I'm just so ashamed. I can't look at him directly. I sort of look around him mainly because I'm scared to death that Jesus is going to look straight into my heart and he is going to remind me and expose me for who I really am. See, I wasn't there when he needed me like I claimed I would be. <laughs> I lied. I deceived and I denied. Who am I? I'm nothing. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to do what I know I can do best. I failed miserably as being a follower of Jesus. I was a fair fisherman, had the decent amount of respect among my fellow brothers. That's something I know how to do and it's safe. I can go out on the Sea of Galilee and I can hide from the world. I can't face this world. I can't face the people that saw me walk with him for three years. Oh, I ate it up at the time, but now I just want to run and hide. And then Jesus came to the shoreline. We had been out fishing all night and we absolutely caught nothing. But the next morning when we approached the shore about a hundred yards, Jesus, from a distance, said, throw your net over. Where does that sound familiar? <laughs> it reminds me of another day. But this time we threw the net over and we pulled up so many large fish, 153 different types of fish. They weren't even all the same. The net didn't look like it would hold, but it did. And so 
I realized that it was my Lord again, and I did what I normally do. It was just an instinct. I jumped into water so I could go see him. Now, my friends then rowed the boat back into the shore, and there he spoke to us. He had built a fire, a charcoal fire, there on the shoreline, and he was cooking some fish, and then he asked for some of ours, and he had some bread there. Sort of reminded me of something. The charcoal fire. Yes, it was only a few nights ago I warmed my hands. The night I denied him, I warmed my hands around a charcoal fire. I tried to sort of slip in to get warm and nobody would notice me, but they did. Oh my gosh. It must be just a coincidence. It's just my own conscience bothering me. Then he takes fish and, and bread. Where, that reminds me a little bit of how he took just a couple of fish and some bread and fed a multitude of people. Well, this time was different. He was just sharing it with his closest companions. I wanted to be there, but I didn't. And then his eye caught me. It caught my eye. And he asked me that piercing question and it pierced my soul when he said, do I love him? I have always loved him. I still love him. I was just frightened. I wanted to tell him Lord, this was what was happening, and this is why I did what I did, and all I could do is answer, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, at least that's out of the way. But then he asked again. That hurt. Did he not hear me the first time? Why did he ask me again? I think to myself. And I asked as quick as I could, yes, Lord, you know I love you. But the time that hurt the most was the third time. See, things come in threes for some reason. I don't know why that is. Maybe I'm just superstitious. I'm sitting there thinking about those three times I <laughs> totally denied even knowing who he was. And a third time, now he's asking me, do I... Really love him? Is that what he's saying? Am I just saying I love him? Does he not believe me? Just pure frustration. I cried out to him and said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And then he encourages me to do something. You know what he encouraged me to do? He encouraged me to stop fishing in a boat. And he reminded me that I, would be, I was to be a fisher of men. I made him a promise. I made him a commitment. I left that old life. And here I am back. I return right back to it. Am I a complete coward? But he reminded me I made a promise. I don't know. Can I own up to this promise? He's asking me to go and reach others. Now, I have a wonderful story to tell them. I mean, Jesus wasn't left on the cross. For goodness sake, he is alive. It is a message that needs to be heard. But I'm not sure that I'm the right man for it. I can't imagine what Peter must have felt, but in a way I can. See, I think that we all, at times in our life, some of us have made promises that we didn't keep. I think we've all gotten discouraged. Maybe the circumstances of life have just taken us down a road we never expected. We just couldn't see it coming. 
We weren't really listening that close to God. We wanted all the benefits of his love. We want to go to heaven. I don't know many people that don't want to go to heaven. But we don't know what it really means to follow. We want the gift of life eternal. Maybe you are that person. Maybe there was a time when you were younger. Maybe you were sitting in a church. Maybe you, your parents took you and the minister was preaching this sermon this one Sunday. Maybe it was in a revival meeting. Maybe you were just at home. I don't know. But you encountered him. There for a moment, you really believed. And someone told you that God loves you. And you had a moment of weakness where you started to really embrace it. And you were filled with this huge conviction of things you've done in the past. And you realized that you were so lost alone in the world. But for a moment, you felt like maybe there was something special about you enough that this man Jesus would die for me and wipe away my sins, to make me a brand new person. And so I accepted it. And my heart was filled now, not with conviction anymore, but with this great joy, I couldn't contain myself. Tears run down my face. I realized, maybe for the first time in my life, that I could trust God. Is that you? You remember that? You remember that day you just felt especially close to him? That there was nothing better. But somewhere between then and now, I don't know if it's just something that happened. Maybe it was just gradual. Most times I think that's what happens is we just gradually sort of fall away from that experience. We get back into the real world with the real people, the same friends and the same things. Maybe we meet someone that we want to spend our life with and they just don't believe in this stuff and so we settle in for compromising our own faith. We don't really speak it out loud because it makes them uncomfortable. And we fade away. Maybe we made a promise. How many have ever made God a promise? Maybe you prayed out of desperation, Lord, please help me in this time of trouble. I promise if you do, I will give you this. Have you done that? I think we've all sort of bargained with God. We need a miracle. We need a divine intervention in our life because circumstances are out of control and it is all coming crashing in on us. And so we bargain with God. If you will just do this, I will do that. In some cases, we were just scared, desperate. Prayer was not the first result. We would have never even thought of prayer. It was the last action to be taken. It was my Hail Mary. The last chance. So we desperately cry out to God. And we promised him, if you'll do this, I'll do this. Simon Peter struggled. But yet once he made a commitment, man, he was all in. Once he really opened his heart to Jesus, even the time he left the boat and he himself walked on water, as long as he kept his eyes focused on Jesus, he didn't sink. It's when he took his eyes off Christ that he went into the depths of the water. And Christ still reached down and saved his life. Simon did love Jesus. And maybe that's why this hurts so badly. How can I hurt someone 
that I love so much? How can I let fear overtake everything that I deem worthy and good? What did I lose my mind? Am I that weak? We all feel this way. Whether you admit it or not, there are times you really feel strong in your faith, and there are other times you feel like you're losing your faith. We make promises to God, Lord, I will serve you the rest of my life. It's easy to say those words, and we really mean it when we say it. But when the storm does not subside, and the waves come crashing in on the boat, and we're being tossed to and fro, after a while, we get weary and we get tired. We become vulnerable, and the devil takes advantage of those times in our weakness. See, we made a promise to God. Satan does not like that. He is not going to taunt those who didn't. He's going to taunt those who did. He's going to come after those who said, Yes, Lord, count on me. Far too many times we just attribute it to conditions of the world, but we don't realize that we're being tested or tempted by Satan, just as Jesus was tested and tempted in the desert for 40 days. He looks to find our weak spot and he exploits it and he is a pro at it. And we are very predictable. See, when we take our eyes off of Jesus, we can't see. When we take our eyes off of Jesus, we find ourselves trying to fix things ourselves. Somehow we live in this delusionary world that somehow we can reminisce about the old days and somehow that will save us. But yet... That was then and this is now. And I'm not the same person I am now as I was then. And if I'm really honest, when I look back then, it wasn't so glorious as my imagination believes. There were times I was so lost. And personally, I just don't want to go back the memory of those things hurt my soul. And when Jesus forgave me of my sins, he wiped it out of his memory. So what does Satan do? Is He, re he puts it back in mind. And then we go through this whole thing again. One moment we feel forgiven, the next minute we can't forgive ourselves. Peter was struggling. But Jesus had commissioned him. He had commissioned him to be the rock of the church. See, Simon Peter was going to be the authority of the church on this earth. He was going to be the head. It wasn't going to be John. It wasn't going to be any of the other disciples. They all had their role. But Simon Peter would be the leader. He also reminded him that, Simon, when you were young, you went wherever you wished. You had a fire in your belly to do whatever you want. You were headstrong. But as you get older, you're going to mature and you're going to see that someone's going to come and take you away someday. And they're going to take you to a place you don't want to be. And he was indicating this to Simon, that you too shall die on a cross. Many of us realize in our studies that when Simon was crucified later in life, he was crucified upside down. But he paid a price. All those disciples paid a price. 
They gave their whole life for the advancement of the kingdom of God. They were empowered with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and they would be the leaders of the new movement called the way and that, that Christianity then would take root and they would be the leaders, but they would all pay a huge price. But the rewards are unspeakable. We all pay a price. We all do. Some of us have got to move away from the guilt in our hearts for how we have betrayed and denied him. We need to ask God to remind us of the first day that we met him. We need to own the promise that we promised him. That I'll give my whole life, not half of it, but all of it. We need to find healing around the charcoal fire. See, Jesus was not angry at Simon Peter. He wasn't trying to make him feel guilty. He wasn't there trying to humiliate him in front of his friends. Jesus was putting salt in the wound that would not heal because he was depending on Simon Peter and he was reminding him, yes, you have a choice. You can go back to the old life or you can follow the one that you promised me, the one that I called you to. See, I called you to be a fisher of men. I called you to be the rock of the church. And I know you feel unworthy, but that is good for your soul because it will humble you and make you dependent on me and the power of my spirit. There's much to do, Simon. I'm not going to be here much longer on this earth. Now, I will return someday, but I won't be here much longer. And it's going to be up to you and all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, to carry this great message on. See, I didn't die just for one group of people. Just like there are many fish in the net, I died for everyone. There are many out there that have never heard. They don't know the story. And it is you that must go and tell it. Journey ahead of you. And there'll be times it'll be very hard, but it'll be a time in which you will grow and you will learn how to depend on me that you will seek my Holy Spirit and you will see miracles take place and lives will change. I have called you. How many in here feel that God has called you to do more than just reminisce about the past? He has called us to be real in our faith. In this day and age of which we live on this earth and we see all that is going on, we see the violence that's taking place, we see the pure evil that is all over this world, we see people right now running and living in fear. If there was ever a time that the called people of God need to step up and the church needs to be the church, is we need to leave the fishing hole, and we need to go toward all who are lost and hurting. We need some courageous, brave Christians that say, Lord, you can count on me. We need to have some holy boldness yes. and not live afraid. Amen. We need to speak truth and then allow the Holy yes. Spirit of God to change the heart of a person. We need to learn how it is to trust in Him in the storm. I want to encourage you, church. Be the church alive. It is time, it is overdue for a great awakening in our country and in our church houses. 
We've got to stop playing church and be the church. Jesus has called us. The Lord God has called us. We made a promise the day we accepted him into our hearts. We need to own it Amen. and live it. We can live in shame. We can live in the past if you want. But I promise you, it will carry you nowhere but despair. Amen. Now is the moment. The day is the day of salvation. Now is the time that we need to be the hands and feet and the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ in a world that has fallen. Amen. Now is the time that our lamps be full of the oil as we serve him to the very end until he comes again. We don't need to be sitting on a mountain waiting for him to come. We need to be living our faith until he comes. Yes. That's how the great awakening will take place in our land. People with the passion. Yes. We don't need to be perfect, but we need to know the one that is perfect. And we need to follow him. And we need to have that passion in our souls. Yes. Let's say, Lord, all my life I give to you. Not just part of it. Wipe away the past. It is over. Amen. Today is the day to follow him. Let us pray. Gracious God, let us open our spiritual eyes to see your hand at work right now on this day in our land all over this world, the urgency to be the true hands and feet of the risen Lord in our world. Give us a passion. Yeah. <clears throat> Give us a desire in our hearts to love the unlovable. Yes. To be a vessel of grace. To be a voice of truth. To not live in fear, Amen. but live trusting in you. Yes. If there was ever a time we needed the word of God preached in our land and taught, it is now. We do not need to water down your word, but we need to trust it. Yes. Amen. And know that you are the one that changes the heart of a person. Let us make our lives available from this day until the last day we take the last breath on this earth. And we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.
still I'm safely kept before your throne. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Your angels are watching over me. Well, I've walked through barren wilderness when my pillow was a star. And I've been through the darkest caverns where no light ever shown still I'll go on cause there was someone who was down on their knees and Lord I thank you for those people praying all this time for me Now, my dear friends, until we meet again, go forth in the name of Jesus. Live in his grace. Do not be afraid. Love one another. And serve him well as we meet a new week. We pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. See you next Sunday.